Coaching Principles and Best Practices, Part 4. Be Intentional. Knowledge is not enough to get desired results. You must have the more elusive ability to teach and to motivate. This defines a leader. If you can't teach and can't motivate, you can't lead. John Wooden, UCLA men's basketball coach. Too many coaches make the mistake of just preparing their athletes to perform in a game setting, bypassing the teaching of fundamental skills that are a necessary foundation for optimal performance. It will behoove you and your players to start with fundamental skills and then help them understand how to translate those skills to a game situation. It doesn't do your players much good to know how to execute a flag football play if they can't effectively pass or catch. Especially for younger children, incorporate activities that emphasize those fundamental skills, running, jumping, throwing, catching, and striking. Including activities like these will also promote health-related and skill-related fitness, which will serve children well in any activity in which they participate. As children get older, the more sport-specific skill you can add into your practices, the better. It's important for the children that you coach for you to keep practices fun and engaging. Mix up your activities so that practices stay fresh and enjoyable for kids. There are a host of resources for coaches. A quick YouTube search of youth running techniques, for example, yields more than 22,000 videos. Use those that are available to you to incorporate new drills that kids will enjoy. It's also important to mention that your practice activities should reinforce athlete effort and not just the skill outcome. You have a great opportunity to teach lessons to children when you're a sports coach. However, you'll miss the opportunity to teach these valuable lessons or encourage the skill development if you aren't intentional about the way that you provide feedback. Most critical to the delivery of effective feedback is the timing. It must be immediate. When you see your athlete performing a skill incorrectly or running a play wrong, stop them immediately and provide feedback. If you wait and try to deliver it after the drill or activity is over, the players aren't effectively able to associate your feedback with their actions. Make sure that your feedback is consistent. Don't stop one athlete from making a mistake and then not stop another who makes a similar one. Concise feedback is direct and to the point and gives the athlete a specific direction and should be used during practice because it's easy to understand and minimally distracting to the activity that's going on. For athletes with ASD, providing feedback is even more critical to reinforce the behavior that you want to see repeated. Be sure that you're only reinforcing when the athlete does what you are specifically asking of them. Be sure to withhold reinforcement when the athlete is off task, and try not to reinforce approximations, as in, that was so close, great job. When you do these things, you're likely reinforcing all of the behavior, regardless if some of it wasn't accurate or if they weren't doing what they should have been. As a coach, it's instinctual to focus on and point out when your athletes or team are making mistakes, but correcting behavior too often may limit the freedom that your players need to learn and to make decisions. This is a balancing act, and you'll get a good feel for what the right balance is for your particular team throughout the season. It's also essential to balance the positive reinforcement with the criticism. Try not to say, don't, all the time. Aim to be a positive coach that can provide constructive feedback in a positive way. For example, rather than just say, don't talk in the huddle, try specifically asking the offending player, when you're talking in the huddle, can you hear me? When you think about a typical day for a kid, they likely have lots of people who tell them not to do things, especially their parents and their teachers. You can develop a much more successful relationship with kids when you aren't constantly telling them what not to do. Or rather them, rather than tell them what not to do, redirect them to something that they can do. There's a fine line between being a coach and being a cheerleader. A coach provides reinforcement and encouragement only when the behavior and the skill demonstration is accurate. Provide good quality feedback and don't just rah-rah the kids all the time. By the same token, you should celebrate small victories, not just the outcome. So if your track relay team lost a race, but several individuals improved their personal times, this deserves to be acknowledged and celebrated, even if they didn't win. It's important to celebrate this progress so athletes are motivated to continue. It should be noted, however, that progress is in the eye of the beholder. What are improvement steps for one athlete may not be the same for others, especially for athletes with ASD. 
They may not always recognize progress or moments of success. Be sure to enthusiastically celebrate those successes for your athletes with ASD too. When your constructive feedback tends to be too excessive, you run the risk of creating an environment that makes kids afraid to make mistakes. Aim to create a supportive environment that allows for mistakes to a point whereby it teaches children how to make their own decisions and gently tolerates failure for the sake of fostering learning. Additionally, emphasize the process rather than just the outcome. Studies indicate that performance actually decreases the more you focus on the outcome and the less likely kids will be to take a risk, to try, and to set themselves up for possible failure. For example, sometimes it doesn't matter if your kids don't win a rebounding drill at a basketball practice so long as they all improve their boxing out techniques as intended.